Hello, Acceleration Nation. Today, we have a very special podcast featuring perhaps the most followed person that we have ever had on the Own Your Career podcast. We have Dory Clark on the podcast, and she is someone that has north of 300,000 followers on LinkedIn, plus on other social platforms. She's a very prolific writer. She has lots of great books out. Her latest one is The Long Game, about really thinking long-term about your career, life, the decisions that you make. And she's also a professor at my alma mater, Columbia Business School. So I was really fortunate to run into her at a recent event. I asked her to join my podcast and she kindly obliged. As a, another reminder, you don't get what you don't ask for. So I was very fortunate that Dory was so generous with her time. On this podcast today, you are going to learn from the number one ranked communication coach, the importance of communicating and a very neat trick that you can play at your next social event, at your next networking event called Introduction Chicken. You'll also learn about how to protect yourself and your career with AI, how to leverage AI to boost your career rather than disintermediate your career. And you'll learn Dory's number one book recommendation, which is actually a big favorite of mine too. So you'll have to listen to the episode to find out that book recommendation. Let me just remind you of the ways that we can help you own your career. If you're looking for uh, a program and a formula and a framework that will help you land more interviews, more offers, and more money, you can do it yourself. Get our digital course, The Job Acquisition Method. You can have lifetime access to it, watch it, get the worksheets, get the spreadsheets, get the scripts to empower you to own your career. If you prefer to do it together with me, with our coaches, with our community, you can do it together with our group coaching program. And if you are someone that likes to get a personal trainer at the gym or wants that extra support and guidance and 100% unlimited support as you are navigating your career journey and looking for that better job, we offer personalized coaching as well. You can find out all about that at academiacareers.com. You can follow me on LinkedIn. And with that, you're really going to hear the episode with me and Dory Clark. Enjoy and own your career. Welcome to another edition of the Own Your Career podcast, formerly known as the Sick Career Podcast. So as we are going through a name change and trying to communicate that to our audience, there is no better person to have on our podcast than Dory Clark, who is ranked the number one communication coach in the world at least on her LinkedIn profile. I've been uh, fortunate enough to hear Dory speak on multiple podcasts and some of her great YouTube videos and read her HBR articles, Harvard Business Review. And she is a fantastic communicator, fantastic voice for so many things, career-related, communication-related, and so forth. She also happens to be a professor at my alma mater, Columbia Business School. With that, Love to introduce you, Dory. Share a few words about yourself to the Own Your Career audience here. I appreciate it, Alan. Thank you so much. Yeah, I I think you covered a lot of the highlights. I will just add that my most recent book is called The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. And so a lot of the work that I do is around how people can be more strategic thinkers and how we as individuals and as companies that we represent or work for, how we can be more effective at getting our voices and our ideas heard in a crowded and noisy world. And wow, is it crowded. And you have emerged from the crowd. Uh, On LinkedIn alone, you have over 320,000 followers. Plus, I think you're active on some other social platforms as well. Is that true? It it is, yeah. Yeah. So how do you think about that, the long-term game? And when I work with clients, when we work with clients at Academic Careers, we talk to them about their long-term career, but then we generally break down their career into two-year increments because a career could last a long time, but then there's like little steps along the way. So talk a little bit about the premise of your new book and some of the findings and advice that you have to offer. Yeah, absolutely. So I think your point is a really good one, which is, you know, everybody in general thinks that long-term thinking is a good thing. It's something we should encourage, but it's also true 
that it feels completely overwhelming if we just sort of stare it in the f face and say, oh, well, you know, he here's where I want to be in 20 years or 10 years or 30 years or whatever the increment is. And it can pretty quickly lead to paralysis, sometimes because we don't quite know where we want to go, other times because we do know where we want to go, but we have no idea how to do it. And as a result, and because there are plenty of competing priorities and requirements for us that in the short term that sort of snip into our day, for a lot of people, it feels easier to ignore some of the long term questions. And that's not a problem today, and it's not a problem tomorrow. But if you keep compounding it over time, it becomes a huge problem, because we're not doing the things we need to in order to get the outcome we want. And so a lot of what I do is really thinking through and helping people and organizations think through how do we maintain that dual focus of not being so obsessed with the future that we don't get anything done today, but also simultaneously making sure that we're not ignoring the future and just focusing on things that are gratifying in the moment, like responding to emails, but that never end up moving the needle in the ways that we want. Yeah, I'd love if you delve in a little bit personally to you, how you've thought about your career from a long-term perspective and what you're doing also from the short-term perspective to ensure that you're achieving your long-term goals. Yeah. Well, one of the concepts that I talk about in the long game is the idea around Google's 20% time. Mm -hmm. Now, some people are familiar with this. This is something that, at least in the early days of Google, it's, it's become kind of de-emphasized over time. The idea was that Google encouraged its employees to spend up to 20% of their time on these kind of experimental activities that were outside of the regular scope of their job. And it had great results. You know, th this is not random experimentation. The, the idea is that it certainly should be something you're interested in, but it's something you also believe would benefit Google in some way. And so that's how Google News was invented. It's how Gmail was invented and other big strategic sort of touchstones that we have. I think that for all of us, as we think about managing our own careers, and we have to be the captains of this because no one is really going to tell us to do it or order us to do it. But we need to come up with our own version of 20% time. What is the experimental thing that we're doing so that over time we're cultivating new skills, we're meeting new people, we're practicing new things? Because that is something that both keeps us interested and keeps us engaged, but it also might turn out to kind of be the salvation we need. I mean, one example from my book, Entrepreneurial You, is there was a guy that I profiled named Pat Flynn who worked at an architecture firm. And... As part of his work at the architecture firm, he got certified in green buildings and he ended up creating a kind of online study guide for passing the test. And we created this website. Everything was out there for free. But at a certain point, he said, you know, I wonder, I bet people might actually pay for it if they had to buy a PDF book rather than just like clicking to like 300 articles or whatever. I wonder if they would buy the book. And so he put it together, and he started offering a book for sale that was the study guide he had created. And it turns out that within a few months, he was actually earning more from selling this PDF study guide book than he was from his day job. And that turned into the thing that saved him when a few months later, he actually got laid off from his job. So cultivating this sort of side hustle, cultivating the side interest is something that can be pretty valuable in the long term. Yeah. So a couple of things you touched on there. One, I'm a big Pat Flynn fan myself. I listen to SPI, I think Smart Passive Income. So a big fan there. And also during my time at Google, those 20% projects did kind of exist. I was more encouraged in the engineering teams, but I took on some of those myself as well. One of the percent projects that I took on was a project called Perfolution, the revolution of performance management. And that was something that I was personally interested in. My leadership gave me some leash for that to like take that and lead that. We eventually rolled it out to a multi-thousand person organization. Looking back in hindsight, that was back in like 2014 or so, has really formulated where I've come now in terms of like helping growing, developing and accelerating careers. I've just Such a perfect example. I love that. Yeah. Well, thank you for serving that one up on the silver platter for me. Pivoting a little to communication. I I've seen your work much more often at like TED Talks and YouTube on public like speaking engagements, but communication is often one-on-one -on -one communication, like what we're doing now. 
And a big part of what we focus on with our clients and the advice that I have for people that are looking to grow their career is to build relationships. And the key to building relationships that I have found is through communicating, talking and listening, probably listening more than talking. Love to hear some of your insights and advice on communicating and less so from the big public communication, but how do you build rapport and relationships with people that help you learn, grow, and help achieve that long game plan that you're seeking. Yeah, I love it that you're raising this, Alan. One of the the big projects that actually consumed a lot of my time last year was I was doing work with Microsoft around listening skills because they were updating their sales training curriculum. And as a piece of it, I really respect this, they decided that one of the fundamental pieces, the building blocks, had to be around effective questions and effective listening as kind of the basis because you know you can pitch all you want you can sell all you want but if you don't have a good foundational understanding of what the other person actually needs or wants then it's going to fall on deaf ears as a result both before and during uh spent a lot of time thinking about these questions i mean i honestly when it comes to relationships and building connections i i have a little game that i play at like cocktail parties or when I'm meeting new people. And I I basically call it like introduction chicken, where uh, I try to go as long as I possibly can without telling somebody anything about me. I just try to keep asking questions because whatever I'm going to tell them about me, it's going to be a lot more impactful if it's something that's relevant to them or, or connected in some way. Oh, you went to Columbia? Oh, well, that's yes, that's a thing. Oh, I do some teaching there that'll matter a lot more than if I just rattled off a bunch of disconnected biographical facts. And so I like to try to do as much intelligence gathering as possible about the other person until basically they're forcing me to talk about myself. No, 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 I've been talking too much here. Tell me about you. And then finally I'll relent, but it takes me a while. That's awesome. And you you can get a lot of insight and you learn a hell of a lot more when you're listening. So in a conversation, When you're telling someone something, you're not learning anything new. When you're listening to someone else, you can learn a boatload. Like I just learned this from you. I'm going to try that game. What do you call it? Communication chicken? Yeah, or introduction chicken. Introduction chicken. I'm going to try that. I actually like that. And also it's interesting. You brought up Microsoft and the work that you did there. So I've heard that Satya Nadella requires all of his leadership team to read nonviolent communication. I think it's by like Dr. Rosenberg or something. I forget who the author is. But I, are you familiar with that work at all? I am. Yeah, absolutely. I, I hadn't heard that Satya requires it, but if that is accurate, which I'm sure it probably is, that would be fantastic. That's such a such a cool thing. Uh, yeah, I heard that or I read that somewhere. I'd have to go Google it and see if it's correct or maybe it's just some strange dream I had. But it sounds like something Satya might have done. And, and it's actually interesting that you were working with Microsoft and you probably work with some other organizations for communication training. Yeah, I certainly have over the years. Yes. What are some of the challenges you find in the organizations that you're there to address? Because if everything was working well on communication, they wouldn't hire you. And I'm sure they're paying you some decent bucks too to go there. So what are the common challenges that you see in the workplace that you're trying to help provide solutions for, whether it's introduction chicken or other tips and tricks. What are some of the common challenges that you see in organizations? Well, you know, just a couple of days ago, Alan, I was doing a workshop with the senior leadership team at a hospital. And it was really interesting because on one hand, everybody feels like their problems are very unique, but it's just so common, whether it's a nonprofit healthcare organization, whether it's a large corporation, whatever it is, you see the same things over and over again. And it's not that solving them is hard in the sense of knowing what to do or being able to diagnose it, but the implementation is challenging because so much of the problem sometimes just stems from a lack of standard operating procedures, a lack of clear boundaries. The the thing that was getting everyone flummoxed, they were, they were so frustrated. People were practically burned out because they were working around the clock when for some reason they had never properly established standards around how to communicate with people when something was urgent versus not urgent. Mm -hmm. As a result, there was an expectation that people needed to respond to everything all the time immediately. And if they kind of freelanced and decided, well, I don't need to respond to this one, every once in a while, just often enough to freak them out, there would be negative repercussions about why didn't you respond to X, Y, Z? As a result, even if it's six o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock on a weekend night, 
everybody's checking their messages and of course, CCing 400 people to let everybody know and you know, oh, I'm on it. And there's a lot of sort of performance associated with it. And after a while, it begins to cripple an organization because everyone is just so worried. You know, they're overloaded with information. They're worried about telegraphing to others that, that they're so responsive and you lose sight of the things that actually are important. So there's a variety of things, but I think often the original sin is just lack of clarity around expectations and procedures. That's so important. Uh, we're actually working on a document internally at Kadima Careers of how to communicate more effectively, how to use Slack, how to use email, when to like call somebody if something's really urgent and how to include the right people on emails because you can just get inundated with all this communication, email, WhatsApp, Someone could be sending you a TikTok message or a Snap message or something like that. It, it, it's just getting more overwhelming rather than less. So I, I know that you've spoken a lot about being deliberate and the, the long game talks about this too, about thinking about where you want to go in life, in your career, be thoughtful about that. Why, why do you think that's so important? I, I think a lot of the work that you do is helping people to be more thoughtful and conscientious of where they're headed and how to get there. But wh why focus on that out of everything in the world for you to focus on? The way that I think about it is sometimes if people want to be contrarian, they're like, well, why does it matter? Why do I even need to have a long-term plan? <laughs> and you know, my short answer is like, okay, if you don't want to, that's cool. Like whatever. But the reason, the reason I think it's important, let's take some ocean metaphors. If you are a jellyfish, it actually doesn't matter where the waves send you because you don't have a brain. If you're a jellyfish, it's not like you really have a preference. You're on one shore, you're on the other shore, you're on a coral reef, kind of who cares, right? It doesn't matter. But for almost all of us, for almost every person who, you know, does have a brain, we have some preferences. You know, we would like to end up on this shore rather than that shore. And it's not that we have perfect control over something as vast as the ocean. There are forces that can overpower us. There are circumstances. There are hurricanes. We can't predict it perfectly, but there are things that you can do. You can position yourself in a certain way. You can catch certain waves. You can make sure that you're setting out at a certain time of day when you know where the tides are going. And it makes it a lot more likely that you're going to end up on a certain shore. And I think for most of us, that effort is worth it because it doesn't guarantee success. It doesn't guarantee an outcome. But if you're able to tip the scales in your favor, you probably want to try to at least do that. And so that's really what we're talking about. And, and, and taking that proactive control rather than being a jellyfish being tossed around the ocean, which could be interesting at times. Sometimes people like to do that and just chill on the beach and whatever. You write a lot in HBR where I think you're probably the most prolific. That's where I see you a lot. I know you're in Newsweek and I, I, I can't keep track of everything. I think you're in, I don't know, like all, all different places. I see on LinkedIn a lot. But you wrote an article about how to make a career pivot. So if you're a jellyfish and you're going towards the coral reef, the, the jellyfish may not care, but us as a human, maybe I'm a human and I'm heading towards a sales career. And all of a sudden I want to get more involved in product management, whatever it is. How do you, not as a jellyfish, not just getting tossed around in the ocean, but as a human being, who theoretically has some control over the path that they take, how would that human make that pivot effectively? And I know in your article, you also talk about without taking a pay cut, sometimes you need to take it, sometimes you don't, but what's some advice for people to take charge of their career and make pivots? And if you have any pivots in your career that you've made relating to some of your personal experience or stories of people or companies you've worked with. For a long time now, I've had my own business, but before that I was changing careers all the time. Not always intentionally, but you know, I started my career as a journalist and I got laid off and then I worked on political campaigns and they lost. So, you know, you had to come up with something else to do. So I've definitely had my share of it. In fact, I've thought a lot about these issues. My first book was called Reinventing You. And it was really focused around these questions of how do you change careers or how do you change jobs in a way that people will take you seriously. And hopefully the transition can be as smooth as possible because it certainly can be disruptive sometimes. And so we want to try to 
minimize that as much as we can. I would say that ultimately there are a few things to keep in mind. If you are in a position where you really need to minimize any income disruptions, you probably want to try to think about it as a Venn diagram, right? Where the Venn diagram for folks who might not remember, it's the two overlapping circles and there's this little piece in between. And if you're jumping from one thing to a completely different thing, it's rare. It's not impossible, but it's pretty rare that you'll be able to come in at the same high level because you won't have the contacts. You won't have the direct experience. And it's not to say you can't work your way up to it, but it's rare that you would be able to immediately make that hop. And so what is often the least disruptive way to do it is to kind of saunter and sort of sashay a little bit from one lily pad to the next. So my example is like, if you're a intellectual property lawyer and you decide you want to be a film director, well, you know, that's great, but that's a pretty hard thing to, to immediately jump into. But what might make it easier for you is if you say, okay, I'm going to get a transitional job for myself and I'm going to move to a law firm in Los Angeles so that I can do my law and make the money that I need to, but I'll be in Los Angeles and I can start networking and connections in the film industry. Or maybe you've been doing IP law and you say, you know what, I'm going to switch into entertainment law and I'm going to try to get entertainment law clients. And that way I'll be that much closer and I'll be understanding the contracts and the studios and how it works. That will eventually enable you to have a much more robust network that'll make it easier for you to move into directing rather than just sort of jumping and hoping. Yeah, I love that. And I haven't really articulated it with a Venn diagram, but uh, I've always said like, hey, you can like move up or you can move over. It's kind of hard to move diagonal. It's kind of hard to move like function and industry or function and region or things like that. So you're a lawyer, you move to LA, you continue to do the law, but then you immerse yourself in other opportunities that can expand your horizon and create additional opportunities for yourself. Yeah, that's well put. And Dory, I love the fact that you talk about the lawyers here, because this is a nice segue to another article that you recently published. And again, you're such a prolific publisher. I know, I know you have a course on that too, which I might take one day, but you wrote an article on the five ways to future proof your career in the age of AI. And I've read a study that the legal profession is going to be one of the most impacted with 43% of legal jobs, maybe being disintermediated by chat GPT and AI and generative AI. It could be like discovery. I don't know enough about the legal profession to understand where it is, but they say that's going to be one of the areas that's going to be hit. So many different industries are going to be hit by it. I'm sure some of your content creation now, like your writing, I'm sure. Like you probably don't use ChatGPT exclusively, but I know lots of writers that use it to come up with some ideas and kind of like be a brainstorming sort of tool. What are some ways that we can help prepare ourselves for the emerging opportunities and threat of generative AI? It's an important question, Alan, because ChatGPT and its friends, we've got Bard, like Anthropic Claude. and, yeah. you know, Claude and all the, all the different ones. It's an amazing tool. You know, this is something that is directly useful and relevant today. Five years ago, there were plenty of McKinsey studies and things like that saying, you know, okay, by 2030, X percentage of jobs are going to be disrupted. And you can appreciate it and believe it and say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You can actually see it now. The time is upon us and you can see the use case and it's only going to get more extreme. So I think there's a few things we have to keep in mind. I mean, first of all, for any given individual, it will dramatically speed up your process. Now, I am not a fan of, for a variety of reasons, you know, ranging from copyright to just sort of the intellectual pursuit. I'm not a fan of having ChatGPT like write actual articles, like sort of end use things, but as a kind of back office tool, like help me come up with a headline for this or help me come up with 10 good ideas about articles I could write or something like that is sort of a brainstorming partner. It's fantastic. And for almost every job, no matter how awesome your job is, you have some kind of administrative overhead kind of tasks. If you're a professor, you have to write recommendation letters or something, right? That is a fairly standardized task, but it takes time and you have to personalize it. And now, oh my God, ChatGPT can bang those out if you put in the right inputs. 
So how do you protect yourself against it? I mean, you know, the good news is for you as an individual, you can leverage it to work faster and get some of the boring stuff done faster. But I think some of the most important things to keep in mind, number one, it has always been important, but it has never been more important for us as individuals to create strong personal brands. Because anyone that feels expendable in an organization, anyone where it's like, oh, you know, what do they do around here again? <laughs> that person is probably going to be gone because ChatGPT can do it for a $20 a month subscription fee, exactly. which is a lot less than your freaking health insurance. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, so you need, you need to be developing a brand such that anyone in your organization, if they say, oh, well, you know, what does Bob do around here? Everybody says, oh my God, here's what Bob does. And we can't live without Bob. Bob is so value added. Y you need to have a level of, of sort of knowledge and saturation amongst your peers about what precisely is the value that you bring. And if you have that, great. But if you don't, a lot of what you do is probably in danger. And along with that is the importance of actually cultivating deep expertise because ChatGPT is a wonderful kind of utility infielder, but it sort of knows about a lot of things. It has some deep knowledge, but this is a problem that might be corrected eventually. But right now, it still has problems with hallucinations. We don't really know like, okay, are you, are you making that up? Like it sounds plausible, but is it actually true? Like it will get you 80 or 90% of the way there. But at the end of the day, you want to have a expert, a human expert to say, you know, Alan, is this true what GPT says? And, you know, if you're the expert, you can look it over and say, yes, this is true. Oh no, this part is not. Don't do that. And being the kind of final word trusted expert in something is going to be a valuable skill. And I think chat GPT is just learning from the humans that created it because I've worked with a lot of employees that would sometimes tell you stuff that they sounded very authoritative. Uh, and you, you dug in and it was all bullshit. It was all hallucination. So maybe it's just mimicking us as humans anyway. I'm curious, Alan, how are you using chat GPT? So I use it for some content creation, like for some help. So I'm a very logical person. If there's a scale of one to 10, and Mr. Spock is number one in terms of logic to emotiveness. And like Oprah is number 10. I'm like a 1.1. But that doesn't always work with people, including my wife, including my kids, including my mom and some clients sometimes. So sometimes I will use it to have my thoughts or like have my words become more emotive, become more like empathetic. Because I love it that you're using a computer to do yeah. that. That's so poetic. <laughs> it's amazing. My wife uses it. Like, I think the point that you mentioned, my wife's a professor at NYU. She's a doctor too. And she writes recommendations and she doesn't want to turn people away, but it's a very time consuming activity. So she puts in a few bullets about what the person did. And she's like, Hey, write a recommendation for this person to get into Harvard medical school or whatever yeah. school they're applying to. So there's so many good uses. We also use it with our clients to prepare for interviews. So if you put a job description in there and you say, hey, Chad GPT, I'm interviewing with the hiring manager for this role at Google. Give me a list of 10 questions that I could expect to receive. And it spits it out. And then you say, give me 10 more just so that I can super prepare. And it'll give you 10 more. And they're pretty good. I used to have to do that myself by looking at the job description. Yes. Imagining in my head. Now it shoots them out, which actually is better. Because it saves of, so much time. It's incredible. Yeah. So those are a few ways that I've used it. It's a super powerful tool. It can be used for good. There's also concerns about evil. We won't go into there on this uh, episode because I think we can both, well, I can at least imagine a fairly dark future, which I'd rather not imagine right now. So a another topic that you've written fairly prolifically on is helping employees with their careers. I read an article of yours, I think it was like last year in HBR, about how to help employees figure out their career goals. And I think you had some good ideas there, and I'd love you to share some of those here. And then I have some, not critique of the ideas you had there, but critique in the fact that should we expect our employers to really give a shit about our careers. They pretend to, and that's why they're bringing you in to talk to a lot of their leaders. But I've seen a lot of talk and not a lot of action on here. So whether it's the employer that can help the employee figure out their career goals or the employee themselves take accountability and control of their own career, what are some of those tips? And like, it's no criticism for you. I think you're saying the right thing. You're like, hey, this issue exists. Employees have challenges navigating your career. An employer, you should help them 
navigate their career because there's lots of benefits for that. And would love to hear you, Dory, about like whether it's employee or employer, what advice do you give for people to help them to navigate their career? So I think actually going back to a theme that we were talking about earlier, Alan, in many cases, I think the fundamental challenge is about just shared expectations because we went culturally from the sort of post-World War II corporate world where we all sort of have the leave it to beaver kind of frame in our mind where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, we know. Like someone would work for the same company for 30 or 40 years and it was very lockstep. It's like, okay, well, you join at 22 and then every year and a half or two years or whatever it is, you kind of get moved up. And it's almost like an escalator where unless you did something really wrong, you would just kind of keep getting moved up at steady intervals. And at the end, they kind of spit you out at 60 or 65 and you've moved on. That's your career. And it didn't require a lot of thought. And it certainly didn't have a lot of personalization. It was just like you went into work every day, you did your thing and, you know, all right, presumably good things would happen and you get a pension at the end of it. And of course, starting especially in the early 90s, you can kind of date it in some ways to the late 80s with the decline slash death of the defined benefit pension plan and the, the rise in 401ks instead, there became this sort of shift where it's like, oh, okay, companies are not going to take care of that anymore and you need to take care of it. And I think that there was essentially a kind of societal hangover where people didn't fully understand the scope of what that change meant. And the companies cottoned onto it pretty fast. They're like, okay, that's not our responsibility anymore. You put the money in your savings account. You'll figure it out. And, and they have layoffs. Everything gets very flat. Everything gets very matrixed. And you have a lot of employees that maybe just really weren't keeping their eye on the ball. And they sort of thought that the rules from the 70s and 60s were still in place. But those rules had changed. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you get a lot of unhappy employees because they're like, where's my escalator? Where's my promotion every two years? And it's not happening because at a really structural level, a lot of companies have hollowed out middle management. There's not positions for people to rise to anymore because the organizations are so flat. And so you just have this structural problem. As a result of all of that, I mean, I think you're correct. The answer is yes, employees have to realize that it is their responsibility in the end. Nobody's coming to save you. You need to be the captain of your career. Absolutely. And, you know, that's the optimal scenario. In addition to that, however, it would be great if your boss as a caring person took an interest in your career arc. Like that's actually the sign of a good boss is somebody that cares about you enough to say, well, what are you interested in, Alan? What skills do you want to develop? And, you know, can I give you some assignments that would help you do the thing you're interested in and you're interested in growing in? And so in no way am I suggesting that we need to kind of go back to some sort of paternalistic thing because people shouldn't be responsible for themselves. I mean, they certainly should. But I think it becomes a kind of value added point of differentiation for great bosses to be, unfortunately, the kind of rare few that take enough time and care to really want to develop the overall arc of the, the people who are working for them and take enough interest to say, you know what, Alan, I'd love for you to be working for me forever. And so how do we keep you growing, interested, engaged? How do we, how do we make this a, a place where you feel like you're learning things every day? And if you do that, you're not going to want to leave. And so it's better for you and it's better for them. I think it would be awesome. If you have a boss that does that, I've had 38 bosses in my career. Nine of them are assholes. I actually posted that once on LinkedIn and I got told by one of my former employers to pull that down. I got a cease and desist note, but I've had some great ones too. So if you as an individual understand that you might have a good boss, but ultimately we're all employed at will, maybe not as like a tenured professor. I don't know if you're a tenured or a uh, professor there. Oh, no, no. No. So if you're a tenured professor or if you're a unionized employee, you might have- Or if you're in Europe. <laughs> Germany or France or something like that, you might have some other protection. Outside of that, you're ultimately employed at will, which means that the company can fire your ass at any time for any reason, and you can explore greener pastures for any reason at any time. So what should an employee do? If they have a great boss, awesome. Leverage that and be appreciative of that. If you're more likely to have a mediocre boss or unfortunately a crappy boss, as the employee or as an individual focused on their career is thinking about the long game to your book, what should they be doing in the short term 
to make sure that they're making consistent progress in their career, in their life towards that long-term goal? Well, one of the frames that I always like best around this is one that my colleagues, Marshall Goldsmith and Sally Helgeson put forward in their book, How Women Rise. And the book was specifically for women leaders, but I think the concept applies to everyone. And what they talked about was the importance of making sure that you are not excelling at your job at the expense of your career. And I, I love that frame because it's so easy for people. And I mean, especially for the best people, the most high achieving people to be so concerned with doing a good job at their job that they're all consumed and they're taking all the time and they're doing all the things. And surely you are winning praise for that behavior, but it may turn out to be self-defeating in the end. Because if you, for instance, ignore your wider network outside of your job because you're so busy slogging away till 10 o'clock every night, that's really nice for the company. It's less nice for you because if things change and you get laid off one day, who are you going to turn to? The company that laid you off or your friends who also got laid off. I mean, you don't have a lot of good choices. So I think that we have to just be mindful. Of course, you want to do a good job at, at your current position, but you also need to have that little voice whispering in your ear that like, you know what, this might not last. And if it didn't last, what would you do? And so doing things like maintaining your network and being thoughtful about your connections, maintaining your skills and making sure that you're not letting yourself coast a little bit. I have a person that I know who was a very talented architect who refused to learn AutoCAD. Guess who's not an architect anymore? Because every freaking architect must use AutoCAD. Like it's nice to be able to draw by hand, but that's not a thing anymore. It's just not a thing. And so we have to be willing to sort of step up. It's very interesting, like going back to the Pat Flynn example, Pat Flynn was an architect. He realized that he was capable of building like courses and being able to help support people with passive income. He evolved his career and is very successful now versus this person that said, hey, I'm not buying into this AutoCAD bullshit and I'm going to go by my own path. And they may have a little bit more challenges with their career than Pat Flynn does. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome, Dory. Well, we're running a little low on time. So I always like to ask two questions of our guests before I let you go. One, what is one last piece of sick career advice that you would like to leave our listeners with? One of the things that I always like to do, and I, I feel like it's not that hard to do, we just have to kind of make a choice, is to be a voracious business reader. Now, I, I'm admittedly slightly self-interested because I write <laughs> business books, but if you want to be a successful professional, you know, whether we're talking about books about sort of core business skills, like, you know, how to run better meetings or how to be a better speaker or something like that, or, you know, just things in your industry or overall business trends or things like that. It's so important. We all know, of course, instinctively, we hear about this, we read about it, that everybody's attention span is flagging. All they can take is like 45 seconds on TikTok and then their brain explodes. And so it really becomes a competitive advantage. If you are one of the few people who is able to consistently engage in deep, long form content, you are going to just know more than other people. And you're going to have more information at your disposal to be able to make interesting connections and form relationships with people and have insights to share and things like that. It will arise naturally if you are feeding yourself more content and more information and so something like an audiobook where you can kind of multitask and do it when you're doing chores or you're commuting or something like that. If you commit to doing one book a week that way, it's incredibly powerful. And it's not a huge amount of time since you're doing something else while you're listening, but it will demonstrably improve your overall knowledge and awareness and ability to excel. I, I know you have a whole plethora of books that are great, and we'll definitely link to those in the show notes. But is there a book or two that you most commonly recommend or gift to people as they can continue to learn this long form content? Leaving aside my books, yeah. I will say one of my all time favorites is by Robert Cialdini called Influence, influence. the Psychology of Persuasion. I got an autograph uh, it, from him back there. I was able to influence him to get me an autograph book and mail it to me. I there we go. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, you, you've already mastered the principles, Alan, then. But yeah, it sold more than 5 million copies. It is a classic for a reason, especially if you're in sales or marketing, but literally just for any person that needs to accomplish anything in the world, it is an extremely useful book. And then last question, 
What's the best way that people can follow you and support you? Thank you, Alan. The best sort of hub for everything is my website. It's doryclark.com. And uh, I have literally hundreds of free articles uh, available on there that I've, I've written. And for folks who are interested in strategic thinking and, and kind of my newest work, uh, if you go to doryclark.com slash the long game, you can download a free strategic thinking self-assessment. Awesome. And I checked out your website before and you do have links to all those articles. And I don't know if they're able to get behind the paywall or I'm just seeing it because I'm an HBR reader, but there's lots of great stuff on there and hopefully- H HBR limits it, but you get a certain number of free articles every month. Got so it. Okay. Uh, so we, we, we can drip our learning from Dory or exactly. uh, by month, maybe five articles per month over the next year. So maybe we can get 60 articles for 2024. Awesome, Dory. Well, this was such a great conversation. I'm glad that our paths crossed at the Forte Foundation's event, which is a great organization to support women leaders in MBA programs. And thank you for all you do and all I've learned from you. And I'm looking forward to reading the long game. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. So good to talk to you, Alan. Thanks a lot, Dory.